is because there are two types of, of building. There is building from nothing and there is rebuilding. So rebuilding means that you have something that, that is being, you know, that there's a structure that is existing, but it has been allowed to be uh, broken down and, uh, and, and not useful any longer. So it's actually it, harder to rebuild off of something that's been battered like it that. It can be. Than to yeah. start from scratch. Okay, now I, I can relate to this because in Scotland, I can think of at least four different circumstances right around uh, where we are, where there are, where there are castles and old houses that have been left to ruins. But some of those old houses, all you'd have to do is throw a roof on it, and it would, yeah. and, and then. Uh, once you throw a roof on it and protect it against the, the, the humidity, you would be able to uh, do the uh, repertory work on the walls and to get it habitable. Uh, th there's two that I'm thinking of. One just on the way to Blair Gallery, uh, right outside the village. Another one on the way to Pit Lockery. There's this, uh, there's this uh, beautiful house just sitting there, no roof. But otherwise, sound, big rock structure, you know. Uh, throw a roof on, you got a house. I've always been provoked by that. Now, that would be rebuilding. Okay, so what mm -hmm. Nehemiah is sent to do is rebuild the walls, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, then it goes through, excuse me, it goes through all the various trials and tribulations because some of the local inhabitants have a power base there and they don't want the Jews to have rebuilt walls because they want to continue oppressing the Jews. But mm -hmm. Nehemiah has a mandate from the king and even finances and all kinds of support and an armed escort to go and rebuild these walls. And this story is how uh, Nehemiah and Ezra the scribe are able to uh, accomplish this. Now, the last chapter, what we saw is finally Nehemiah succeeded in rebuilding the walls. He succeeded in getting the parapets up to the, up to the proper heights to protect the city. And finally, the last stage was he hung the gates. So, yeah. so everything is now back in place and the walls are there. And now what they have to do, oh, one of the default positions we need to really, really say is that always his position was to pray. Every time he had a challenge, straight to God. This challenge, straight to God. That challenge, straight to God. So this default position of prayer and connecting with Father God is, is that's the reason why it succeeded. And even in the last chapter, chapter seven, at the end of it, uh, the enemies of Israel even were, 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 were making constatations that unless the, the Lord was fighting this battle for them, they would not have been able to do it. So even his enemies are, are, are able to see that God's hand is in this. But that doesn't stop uh, some of the problems that they're having. Now, some of the personal problems that they've had in the first seven chapters have been, for example, you have the enemies that are easily seen. Okay, they're the ones that openly uh, uh, object to ne Nehemiah and the Israelites rebuilding the wall. But then there's also even some of the priests that are on the side of the enemies. There's some of the nobles. We have the problem of some of the nobles who are extracting money from uh, the people who can't pay their bills because they're working on the wall. They, when they're working on the wall, they're not uh, gainfully employed, as it were. So um, th there are all kinds of, um, uh, of difficult situations. And to, to top it off, even the enemies have now intermarried into some of the local Jewish families. So there is mm -hmm. that influence also. Whew. But... Uh, <laughs> It is, it's been overcome by all of them. And now we're on chapter 8 that the wall has been rebuilt. And this is really important because when you have something that God has mandated you to do, <clears throat> he doesn't just put it on the table and say, here, do this. There are There is a process to go through. There is first the recognition of what he's telling you to do. And then there is the mechanics of putting it together. There is also the process of putting together the people that are going to make it happen. Now, this means you have to have leadership qualities. One of the things that we saw in the book of Nehemiah as to what a superb leader this man was, how he every step of the way showed leadership qualities. When the people suffered, he suffered with them. When the people sinned, 
He acknowledged that he was a sinner too. He never uh, separated himself from the plight of his countrymen. His leadership skills were exceptional. And this is one of the reasons why God chose Nehemiah for this job. But you'll find also these exceptional qualities in so many of the leaders. David was an exceptional leader of men. So was Moses. Um, uh, and so was Daniel. Uh, you'll find integrity. You'll find honesty. You'll find the default position is always to go to God. Um, so there are reasons why leadership works the way it works, okay? And Nehemiah uh, dis uh, displayed all of these beautiful uh, techniques of leadership. Uh, now, there's two things that we can glean from that idea of leadership. One is that we can see our leaders and we can glean from that. Now, we, we take our leader, Brenda. He's a good leader. That's why I put my allegiance behind him, because he is an able leader. He has shown these characteristics. He has shown a real concern for all of us. He is not in it for fa financial gain. He's not in it on a power trip. He's, he's imperfect like me, but, but he puts his money where his mouth is. I know him intimately. Um, he shows these leadership qualities, okay? <clears throat> so um, another thing that we can see is when we are called to leadership positions, we need to emulate these type of things. Okay, and that's one of the reasons why God wants us to get to know these godly leaders intimately. Okay, uh, so that that's a bit of is, is that a bit of a background? Is that good enough? Can, should I go forward now, or is that okay? Okay, no. now now we're going to go to Nehemiah um, for uh, Nehemiah um, chapter eight. But starting with Matthew. Okay, wait a minute. The, uh, what I always like to do uh, is I always um, like to start with the New Testament if my main text is Old Testament or vice okay. versa. If my main text is, is, is New Testament, I want to dip into the Old because the two always either complement each other or they will be a counterweight with each other. By that I mean complement each other. You'll find the same doctrine in the Old Testament as you will find in the New Testament. Now, when I say a counterweight, what I mean is that maybe in the Old Testament, God will show you why this doesn't work. Remember that the law was our tutor. It was our teacher. It was our mm -hmm. demonstrator, the one who showed us why uh, mankind is in the shape that it's in, okay? Uh, so the counterweight to that is the gospel of Jesus Christ, him dying on the cross for my sins, him setting me free from the law of sin and death, you see. So that's how... Uh, they complement each other always, all right? But it might be with as a counterweight. But more often than that, it is complementary. You will find the concept of sacrifice everywhere in the Old Testament. You will find the doctrine of the love of God everywhere from cover to cover, okay? So, yes. now, we're going to start with Matthew uh, chapter 4, verses 1 to 4, whoever wants to read that. Now, keep in mind, Matthew was... Uh, was uh, reputed to be a scribe. Uh, but before that, I believe he was a tax collector. So I don't know how that pans out, um, but he was a highly educated man. He could have been, he could have started as a scribe and being ever so literate and educated, became a chief tax collector, repented, and then went back to being a scribe. I don't know. But um, both appear to be true. So, let's go one to four. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Okay, now, whenever I read uh, scripture, uh, what I do, just, to re just so that we get to know each other, um, I am going to give you an aspect of a jewel. You have a jewel here with, with all kinds of, of, of beautiful sides, uh, like a mm -hmm. kaleidoscope. Now, I'm mm -hmm. going to show you one small part of this jewel. But the jewel's big, and it's got many, many sections. So when I talk about a certain bit of scripture, uh, you might say to yourself, oh, yeah, but there are other things in it as well. That's very true. 
There is. But I'm showing you one aspect of it, but that's what makes it the Word of God. Because when you turn it this way or that, you get all kinds of different perspectives. Just like if you hold the beautiful jewel up to a light and you turn it ever so slightly and you see the beautiful rainbow colors uh, dancing around in the facets of the jewel you see. So now in this particular part of Matthew, I want to highlight verse 4 where it says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. This is the linchpin for this particular view of the jewel. That the word of God to Jesus was absolutely beautiful. And the word of God to us has to be beautiful. This book is the most important book in my life. And when I first met God, the second thing he said to me was, the Bible is my word. Okay. Mm -hmm. Once he had, once he had introduced himself and I knew precisely that it was him. And after a certain dialogue happened between him and I, when he started giving me instructions, after I gave my life to him, the first thing he said was, the Bible is how I'm going to talk to you most of the time. Every so often, I'm going to use other ways of talking to you. And he does, and he has. But 90, 95% of the time, it's the Word of God that speaks into my heart. So yes. um, notice in verse 4, it says, man shall not live on bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That is our food. That is how we grow. That is how we get to know him better. And it's a journey. And there will be times when I will read the word of God and I think, oh my goodness, I don't understand that. Matter of fact, I was just pondering on that uh, uh, just this morning. There's a section of scripture that I don't really understand very well. I'm going to uh, uh, open with it tomorrow morning with Judy. Judy and I have uh, our Bible time every morning where we talk to each other and read scripture for about an hour. And so it's, it's the most wonderful time in my entire day and my life and my marriage. It's, it's one of those beautiful times where Judy and I really connect in the spirit. And we, we rarely have uh, disputes. We sometimes have things where she appreciates it differently than I do. Uh, but we're people, aren't we? But the word of God has been what we have based our marriage on for 37 years. And you know what? I'm not sorry because it's done its job and it continues to do its job. So now every word that, 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 that comes out of the word of God. Now, last week, remember, we talked about being hangry. <laughs> I like that word, hangry. You know, where you, you're, you're more likely to get angry if you're hungry, hangry. I, I, I love the way speech kind of, you know, transforms itself. Though the words that we used to use a hundred years ago, they don't use it all now or even 50 years ago. I, if I go back to California, I don't understand a lot of what they're saying. Uh, Nashville, I still get it because I had that accent. But uh, the, the California, even though that's my basic accent, a lot of it, they, they use words I've never heard before. So um, every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God is to be treated as such. It's food. Now, let's yeah. go uh, to Nehemiah chapter 8. We'll start on our main text here. <laughs> Okay, well, verses 1 to 4, let's start. Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. Then he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday before the men and women and those who could understand and all the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. So Ezra the scribe stood on a platform of wood which they had made for this purpose and beside him at his right hand stood Mathathiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah and Maziah and at his left hand Padiah, Bishel, Mal Malachiah, Hashem, Hashbanda, Zechariah, and Mel Me Mehushalem. Wow. Well done. 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 Very good. Oh, oh my you word. Pick that one, Alicia? 
Well, <laughs> someone told us said that to me the other day. Oh, there probably wasn't many Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Johns hanging around at that time. Why? <laughs> no, <laughs> my goodness. <laughs> so, okay, some of the things that we we have to clean. From, well done, my love. That's hard. Uh, that's why. That's one of the reasons why I get you to read. I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now note that Ezra. By the way, to supplement our our study of uh, Nehemiah, it's not a bad idea for you guys to read Ezra on your own time, because Ezra was uh, at the same time of Nehemiah, and he was the priest yeah. when Nehemiah was the administrative leader. Okay. Um, now the next thing is they only had the people present who could understand. Uh, Ezra was flanked by 14 men. Now, notice that uh, Nehemiah was not mentioned in that. Now, I, I suppose that those men were other scribes as well. Mm. That's what I would think. It doesn't say so, but I would have thought that he surrounded himself with people in his profession, especially giving, g giving account of what happens after that, which I'll, I'll go into. Now, um, they would have read the first five books of Moses, which would be uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, um, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now, those were the five books that Jesus actually uh, quoted from the most as well. So those were the core of all of the Torah of the day. Now, apparently, the book of, uh, the book of God had not been read for quite a long time because apparently this was news to all of them, as we will see. Um, now, another thing, we, 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 when we set the scene for this, it was a very, very, um, a very solemn occasion because they actually built a platform just for this purpose. So it was, it was a really uh, formal idea. It wasn't something, well, you know, come and hang out. No, it was, we are here for a very serious purpose. So when Nehemiah and Ezra found the book, it was a huge thing. Hmm? Now, uh, let's go for uh, verses five to eight. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see, all the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Carry on? Yeah, yeah to eight, please. Yeah, to eight. <clears throat> the Levites, Joshua, Bani, Sherabba, Jamin, Akub, Shabbatia, Hodia, Messiah, Messiah. Mas Kelita, Azara, Josabad, Han, Hanan, and Haliah instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. Got to give her a hand, too. Come on, Yay. that wasn't that easy. Come Very on. Good. That wasn't that easy. Now, my, my version says that the, the, there were also 14 in this group that he uh, brought into light. Um, now, right. But my version says that they were identified as Levites. So the question that I had was, does a, does a, I know a priest has to be a Levite, but does a scribe have to be a Levite? Now, in looking that up, I did not get a satisfactory answer. I, I don't mm -hmm. believe that a scribe had to be a Levite, but I think... It, it may be that he did. I, I Maybe you guys will find uh, more success in that than I did. The, the reason why I wanted to look that up is I asked myself the question, well, why is this group of 14 different from the initial 14, you see? Uh, now, uh, one of the things we can glean from this is they worship the Lord. And let me tell you something. The Jewish believers, they are not, uh, they are not uh, kid gloves when they worship. They, they, they weep, they give their hearts, they love the, God, the Lord our God. They are very passionate people. Remember our time at the Wailing Wall, huh? Mm. Uh, you remember that? My goodness. The, 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 the outpouring of, of, of feelings and emotions. They're, and, you know, there is a place where emotions are highly um, uh, uh, relevant and really appropriate. It's appropriate to have emotions 
uh, at various times. And here you can see that they were worshiping, falling with their faces to the ground because they hadn't even um, really heard the word of, the, they were just hearing the word of the Lord for the first time and probably some of them had never heard it. Mm. And remember that the reason why they were deported in the first place 70 years prior was because of apostasy or turning away from the Lord. So when you find a turning away from the Lord, you will find a turning away from his word. When people turn away from the Bible as the word of God, that is when civilization starts to sink, okay? Because the Bible anchors society. The Bible gives standards and it gives boundaries. And it tells us what God tells us that that pertains to life and what God tells us that pertains to death. Mm -hmm. So when we are, 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 are working and living in the word of God, we are moving towards life. And when we go against the word of God, we are moving against life. And that's why God gave it to us because he loves us so much. He wants oh. us to live. Doesn't yeah. want us to go towards death. He wants us to live. And, you know, some people have such a wrong concept. Of, well, he's trying to, you know, he's trying to uh, rain on my parade. Well, he, he's trying to cut my, cut my good times out. No, he's not trying to cut your good times out. He's trying to lead you to life. He's trying to lead you to love. You see, so and, and sometimes you understand the term tough love. Sometimes God shows us tough love, and you can see, it, see it in society now, can't you? So it's like there's not so many Christian schools or whatever mm -hmm. that children are being taught that way. You can see the effect of yes. that not being spoken every day. Of. Yeah, and that's where um, that's where the deportees were at before they went to to um, mm -hmm. the the land of Babylon. Okay, now. Here they're back, and finally someone finds the book of the Lord, the book of the the, the Torah. Yeah. So, so there, there, were, there wouldn't have been many copies of this book of the no, Lord there. You would, know, like it was rare as rare. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. There probably weren't. Keep in mind, I believe that there was a temple destruction as well that had happened. So probably um, it was found under some piles of rocks or something. I don't know where it was. Uh, anyway, that they found it. Now, what happened? then is the people who um, were, were partaking of the word of God, it had a very strong effect on them. So let's read from 9 to 12. And Nehemiah, which is the Tiashaba. Or the governor. Oh, is that what it is? And Ezra, the priest, and the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, this day is holy unto the Lord your God, mourn not, nor weep. For all the people wept when they had heard the words of the law. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions unto them who have nothing prepared. For this day is a holy day unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. So the Thank Levites you. stilled all the people, saying, Hold your peace, for the day is holy, neither be ye grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and to drink, and to send portions and to make great mirth, because they had understood the words that had been declared unto them. Am I reading more? No, that's good. Now we can understand the prodigal son. This really shows us the father's heart, doesn't it? Because, listen, it's, it's understandable that they finally realize how low they've sunk. And they're weeping. They're, oh, my word, have we blown it so bad. But why is it then that Nehemiah and Ezra stop the people and say, no, this is a joyous occasion. Why? Because they realized it. Because repentance has had happened. And when the whole problem with sin is when we either refuse to realize it or we don't realize it and are deceived. But when we are no longer deceived and, and, we, and we do come to the realization, at least then we can do something about it. We can't do something about what we don't know or what we don't acknowledge. So finally the realization hits them 
as to the reason why they had suffered all these things for 70 years, why they had to come home and, and, and uh, look at the beautiful city of Jerusalem in complete ruins, you see. But, but that's why Ezra the scribe and Nehemiah said, no, rejoice, because you've understood something. Now, my dear people, we can make it right. Can you see the Father's heart in here? He doesn't go, yeah, you, heh, 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 you nasty people. Now I'm going to, oh, I'm going to get you now. Now you know what you did. <laughs> Not at all. That is so far from my God's heart. He looks at us with love and with pity and with compassion. He says, I, 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 I just want to help you guys. I just want to give, give, give. I want you to have life. I want you to learn love. I want you to be with me. You're my children. I love you so crazy like. Now the prodigal son makes sense. When the son went off and spent the uh, half of the inheritance of his father's lifelong work and he spent it on, on, on prostitutes and drinking and gambling and all kinds of stuff. And you know, when he, when he comes back, the brother says, I think you should smack the you know what out of him. Right? And, and the father says, no, 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 you've got it all wrong because this son of mine, he was dead. Now look, he's alive. He gives him a signet ring. The signet ring means Boop, do business in the name of the family house. He gives him back his authority and even more. Before he left and he had his inheritance, he didn't have the signet ring. He didn't have the justifying uh, uh, a symbol that would give him power of the house. Now he does. This is the this is the father's heart. He doesn't. He's not after us. He's for us, and you can see it here in Nehemiah. That's why he says, "No, no, don't weep." This is a good day because you've seen it. Now, my dear people, let's do something about it. Can you see that? Beautiful, beautiful passage. So now let's go from 13 to the end of the chapter. So the Levites quieted all the people saying, be still for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink, to send portions and rejoice greatly because they understood the words that, that were declared to them. Now on the second day, the heads of the fathers' houses of all the people, with the priests and Levites, were gathered to Ezra the scribe in order to understand the words of the law. And they found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded by Moses, that the children of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month, and that they should announce and proclaim in all the cities and in Jerusalem, saying, Go out to the mountain and bring olive branches, branches of oil trees, myrtle branches, palm branches, and branches of leafy trees to make booths, as it is written. Then the people went out and brought them and made themselves booths, each one on the roof of his house or in their courtyards or the courts of the house of God and in the open square of the water gate and in the open square of the gate of Ephraim. So the whole assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and sat under the booths. For since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, until that day, the children of Israel had not done so. And so there was very great gladness. Also, day by day, from the first day until the last day, he read from the book of the law of God. And they kept the feast seven days, and on the eighth day, there was a sacred assembly according to the prescribed man manner. Okay, so now this feast was something that was part of the, the law uh, that God told them to observe every year at the seventh month. But this, act, uh, this feast had actually fell into disrepair and was no longer, no, no longer practiced. Judy, Judy's going to tell us a little bit about the Feast of Booths. In the first instance, the Feast of Tabernacles... Um, initiated um, when the people were invited in ancient times to come up to Jerusalem and worship the Lord alongside the Jewish people. So it was a gathering, an ingathering of people other than Jewish people. Oh. The tradition rose from a command given to Moses that Israel should sacrifice 70 bulls, which were then offered for the 70 na nations that descended from Noah. Oh. Okay. Um, it, it's, it's 
it's a it's the it's a harvest festival. Oh, that's right. Okay. okay, and it was supposed a Thanksgiving to, then. Yes. It, okay. It's, good. It's to it's to um, uh, it's a full harvest feast marked with great rejoicing at the ingathering of the fruit of the land, and Israel was also called to instruct the nations in the law of God and of the people to take joy in this task. Okay. Now, uh, just a couple of uh, things that we can we can uh, take from this. First of all, the the feast of booths was a Thanksgiving thing. Okay, it was acknowledging God's grace in uh, the provenance of their survival and, and their food. Um, the next thing, they acted on the word of God. They did something about it. They didn't just read it. Oh, well, that's quite cool. Yeah, we got the fest, you know, the festival of booths and oh, they used to make themselves temporary huts and stuff like that. Uh, quite cool. And then they go their way. No, they said, OK, God has commanded us to do this. Let's do it. Now, myself, I have a certain philosophy. If God says it, you do it. I know that sounds hard-lined, but if God tells me to do something and I'm convinced it's him, I, ha I have to do it. But, you know, he, he, he's, not, he's not like a slave master. He doesn't say, ah, gentis, go and get them. Do the, you. He's, he's, he's not like that. He will never do anything except what is good for me. Yes, did, you, did you notice, though, that in there, at, at this time of the Feast of Booth, one of the things that they were instructed to do was to, ins to teach the people who were coming in from the outside who were not Jewish in the laws of God. Ah, look at that. So there is no excuse. Yeah, this, this idea of a closed Jewish nation no. was not, a, they were, was they not were, God's heart. They were meant to... To yeah, teach them yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. about the laws of God okay. so that they knew that it was a joyous thing and that God was for all people, not just Jews. Mm. Now, can you see the mechanisms of revival here? Because that's basically what it is. And all of us want a personal revival. You know, there have been things in our lives that have not gone well, have not gone right. So I want a personal revival. Revival means to rebreathe or to relive, rebreathe life into something. Now, uh, what happened was they were completely destitute, taken over by a foreign power, deported into a land that wasn't their own, uh, 70 years un un under uh, this uh, regime. They were allowed to go back and restart their nation, you see. So now it would not have been God's plan if they did not have the spiritual revival because the spiritual problem was what made the deportation in the first place. It would not; they would not have been deported if they had stuck to the Torah and given their lives and their hearts to Father God. That was the problem, you see. So here's the mechanism of revival. First of all, you have to pay for what you've done. There is accountability. That's just the truth. Now the next thing is a recognition of what went wrong and why it went wrong. Then you start to come before the Lord. You do go through the cycle of repentance and confession. And then you have the restoration and then the revival.